So welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to the uh, kickoff of the 2017-18 Timothy Johnson Medical Scholars uh, Seminar Series. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, why it's named after Dr. Timothy Johnson, uh, he was one of the founding faculty members of the School of Medicine here and was very uh, integral in the development and uh, delivery of the basic science curriculum and the curriculum as a whole to the medical school and really was one of the one of the key players on the ground getting this medical school going and so unfortunately uh, Dr. Johnson uh, died a couple years ago and he had the 
We had the honor of having him here when we inaugurated the series, naming it after him for the first uh, talk in that series, for which he was very grateful, I know, and he would be very, very proud to see how this series has progressed. So we're very excited to continue this tradition on. Uh, so kicking off uh, today's uh, program is Dr. Marshall Summer from the Children's National Medical Center. I couldn't think of a better, more appropriate person for this series uh, than Dr. Summer, uh, which I think will become apparent um, throughout his presentation. Uh, by way of a brief introduction, Dr. Summer is the director of the Rare Disease Institute and the chief of the uh, Division of Genetics and Metabolism at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jerry, I think we're getting a little feedback. Uh, I hear a little bit of a ringing up here. Anyway, um, he also serves as a Margaret O'Malley Chair in Molecular Genetics and Professor of Pediatrics at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Summer did his undergraduate work in molecular biology at Vanderbilt, his medical degree at the University of Tennessee Center for Health Sciences, his pediatrics residency at Vanderbilt, his fellowship in clinical and biochemical genetics at the Division of Medical Genetics at Vanderbilt, and then served as an assistant associate and a full professor of pediatrics and molecular physiology and biophysics at Vanderbilt until 2010 when he moved to Children's National Medical Center. In case you see a thread there, Vanderbilt, University of Tennessee, there, he bleeds orange. Uh, he's a Tennessean, uh, born and raised. Black and gold. <laughs> Black and gold. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that's right, it's Vanderbilt, not, not UT. <clears throat> anyway, he did move to DC in 2010 to take up his current positions at the Children's National Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Summers serves on the board of directors of the National Organization for Rare Disorders. He chairs their scientific and medical advisory board. He's president for the Society of the Study of Inherited Metabolic Disorders, uh, serves on the NIH Scientific Review Committee for bench, the Bench to Bedside program. Uh, he's editor-in-chief in Molecular Genetics and Metabolism Reports. Been very involved nationally, by the way. He uh, was very instrumental in Washington, D.C. with U.S. Congress in getting uh, the Walter Reed campus uh, reallocated, the reallocation bill, and that's a very exciting opportunity Children's National has in the district, and, and we're actually working uh, closely with Children's National on collaborations. That's a great partnership. I think you're all going to hear more about that in the future. He also has been involved with the IRB National Alliance Network Bill in Congress, so he's somebody who really has an impact on policy as well as in medicine and the science that underlies medicine. Um, his research is uh, focused on uh, the underlying genetics and biochemistry of inherited disorders. Uh, he's been involved with the genetic mapping of the human growth hormone releasing uh, factor gene, molecular cloning and sequencing of the human sodium hydrogen ion exchanger. Uh, linkage he developed linkage maps for human carbamyl phosphate synthetase studied the role of mutations of vasopressin, uh, neurofysin gene, and autosomal dominant neurohypophysial diabetes insipidus, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, but also, major contributions for patients in, in uh, management of patients with urea cycle disorders, including nutritional management. And so his work goes from the fundamental biochemistry, molecular genetics, right on up to the delivery of care for children and their families with these disorders. He's the real deal in the whole package and is involved with the initial discoveries, working with teams of investigators and clinicians, and right up to the care to make sure children, both the Children's National Medical Center and, frankly, all over the country and the world benefit from the work that he's involved with. So he's a classic, uh, in my opinion, classic physician scientist who's trained as a physician but also as a scientist and I think is an ideal person and role model for this program. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marshall Summer. Let me clip this back up there. It fell off. That's my fault. Yeah, I don't know who that guy is he just talked about. Ain't me. I am actually a good old boy from Tennessee, which we had fun swapping Tennessee stories last night. And I suggest at some point in time you ask uh, Dr. Friedlander about the incident with the beagle and the cologne. And I'm going to let you all wonder about that one. <laughs> all right. So one of the things I've done for most of my career is I've worked with patients with rare genetic conditions, and what we're going to talk about today is how actually um, a condition that can only affect four or five, you know, maybe ten patients in the world can actually have a significant impact on literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients. Are there any Latin scholars in the uh, audience? You'll get the, you'll get the intro slide if you are in the use of watermelon as a lead-in, otherwise you're going to have to look it up later on your own. So, biochemistry after lunch. 
Uh, let's see if we can keep everybody's heads up. Um, when you think of this, this is what you think of with biochemistry. Hideously insane, complex wall charts with interlocking pathways going all sorts of directions. This is the Tokyo subway system. <laughs> <laughs> Looks kind of similar, doesn't it? Um, yet 15 million people get to work every day using this. So even though biochemistry is complex, if you try to take it in as a whole, when you actually break it down into where you need to get, it's actually quite manageable. So I'd like to introduce a concept. This is one we've been playing with for, I don't know, about 25 years now. And it's basically environmentally determined uh, genetic expression. And that's just the simple concept that genes and the environment interact with each other. And that if I give you, if everyone in this room, if I gave you an extra chromosome 21, we talked about this in our little seminar earlier, you'd all have Down syndrome. Doesn't matter what the environment is, you're just going to have it. If I take you out to I-81 and stake you out in the middle of it and a truck hits you at 80 miles an hour, it doesn't really matter what your genetics are, you're going to get crushed. So that's an extreme environment. But everybody lives in the middle. I know this was probably given the North Korea stuff a poor choice of graphic image here. I apologize for that. Didn't think that one through. Um, but most folks live in the middle. You have mild changes that don't really affect your day-to-day -day living. If they did, they wouldn't hang around in the population. But once you start to get into environmental extremes, suddenly those things can pop out and start to cause human phenotype. So one of the places to look for the effects of genetic variation is actually in extreme environments, the ICU, chemotherapy, newborn nursery, things like that. One of the things I want you to be careful about, there's a lot of pressure right now about personalized medicine. You know, we're, I'm, I'm going to take a quick second and do an editorial comment here. So everyone's telling you, I know we sequence your genome and then you will be healthy. Not quite. So most of the things we're going to find in those sequences are going to have very mild effects. And so are you going to make a major lifestyle adjustment for something that might have a 2 to 3% effect size as a probability when you're 60s and 70s, but to actually change that outcome, you may have to make a major lifestyle change. I mean, we've known that drinking and obesity are bad for you for a long time, and yet they're still around. So I think the actual effects on that for some of these intermediate changes is not going to have a lot of effect on people's behavior. But what you can do with the system is find mechanisms. And if you can find mechanisms, sometimes you can find a way to manipulate those artificially. So treasure your exceptions. This is a great quote um, from William Bateson, and basically what it means is you are going to see patients. I know we have PhDs and MDs in the group here. The MDs will see patients. The PhDs will see examples and experiments where something happened you did not expect. Do not discard that information. Hang on to it. You may not know what to do with it today, but in a year or two or down the road, suddenly it's going to fall into place. You kind of go, wait a minute. Those mice that did this weird thing or that patient that did not do what I expected them to do that's going to end up being important to you. So I really think this is actually one of the most important things we talk about today. If you remember anything, please try to remember that. Rare disease patients are particularly good because there are 8,000 different rare diseases now. All of these are human models of a genetic condition that has a phenotype that we can actually look at and measure. And usually it's one gene, sometimes it's a cluster of genes. But how those manifest in the human condition teaches us a lot about everyone else. So even though a, you know, a disease may just affect a handful, that biological process is present in everyone. So now we've got to do some biochemistry. OK. This is the urea cycle. That is dull, boring, and flat, except for the enzyme with the unfortunate acronym two-thirds of the way through. <laughs> OK, you guys win. When I did this lecture at Vanderbilt, it took them 30 seconds to get that joke. <laughs> Good, good for you guys. Um, but you imagine trying to tell a family they've got it, their child's got a defect in arginosuccinic acid synthase deficiency. <laughs> All right. This, however, is not the reality. Human beings are three-dimensional with multi-organ systems, and what expresses in one tissue does not express in the other. So one of the things we did a few years ago, we actually took this urea cycle. What's the purpose of it? Well, the primary is to make urea. It was the first biochemical process described as a cycle by Hans Krebs back in 1923. He went on to win the Nobel Prize for the Krebs cycle, but was quoted later on as saying he wished he'd won it for the urea cycle. I agree with him on that. Um, but it takes waste nitrogen, 
and transforms it into urea. Along the way, it makes arginine and citrulline. And uh, Fred Murad won the Nobel Prize in 1992 for describing that also that arginine can be routed into making nitric oxide, which is an important signaling molecule. Now, let's look at some tissues, though. It's not actually that simple. It's not a single-purpose pathway. If I take the liver, and we actually looked at the protein levels in all these tissues, and the thickness of the arrows here reflects the amount of protein in there, and the liver does what you'd expect. It's a detox organ. Your liver's job is to get rid of stuff you don't want, make some biomolecules you need from other stuff. But in the liver, the urea cycle is basically making urea. That's why when we want to treat one of these patients to prevent the hyperaminemia, we transplant them, we give them a new liver. We call it poor man's gene therapy, but it works pretty well. So we can actually restore their ability to clear ammonia, but we can't do some of the other things. Now, if I take small intestine and gut, you've got actually almost as much urea cycle. If you think about how much gut you have, probably at a mass basis, you've got even more, but it stops right here. So what's going on there? Well, as it turns out, the gut is where you make all of your bioavailable arginine, which you need for making proteins, polyamines, you know, all kinds of things. Signaling molecule, it's a floor cleaner, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Also, you export citrulline, which actually you use as a precursor molecule for arginine, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So actually, one of the markers for a successful gut transplant, which they do gut transplants, someone has dead gut, is actually the reappearance of citrulline in the plasma. So the gut is actually a biosynthetic organ using the urea cycle to do that. Now, if I go to the lung, I see something different. I don't see the upper part of the cycle. That's just in the gut and the liver. But I do see the intermediate parts, ASS, ASL. And then suddenly I start to see a lot of significant amounts of nitric oxide. Well, why the lung? Well, we talk, think about physiology. All of the blood that pumps through your body has to pump through your lung. You want a low resistance system. Now, I love coming to an engineering school because we can talk about you know, the physics and dynamics of that, but you've got to pump all that blood, so that means those capillaries and arteries in the lung need to be full wide open. So it's actually more important for your lung to keep things dilated than constricted. So nitric oxide is the signaling molecule that tells those blood vessels to dilate. So, in the lung, you have ASS, ASL, and then the nitric oxide synthases. Now, what's kind of fun about that is no loop, no system is perfectly efficient. There's no such thing as a closed system biologically. So you've got to get a new supply of citrulline and arginine. Where do you think it comes from? You guys know now. Where? The yeah, the gut. So the gut supplies new citrulline and arginine to supply the lung with the precursor molecules it needs to make nitric oxide. So now you've got your guts tied to your lung, your liver ties in there too by detoxifying the whole system. So what you've got now is inner organ communication at a biochemical level. The heart does the same thing. What's, you know, do you think it's important to keep blood vessels open in the heart? Damn right it is. You've got coronary artery vessels, you've got to keep them dilated, nitric oxide plays a huge role in that. So you have actually a similar system to what you have. And there's actually a couple of other uses too. When I started in genetics uh, back in the 80s, we were certain that it took about 100,000 genes to make a human, mainly because we knew how many it took to make a fly and we thought we were more complex than flies. How many do we actually have? Anybody care to guess or didn't know? 30, about 24 to 30,000, somewhere in there. And we can't even actually decide on that number, but it's about a quarter of what we thought. So where's the complexity? Because actually there were a lot of calculations generating that 100,000 gene number. Turns out you reuse the same genes for doing different things. Urea cycle is a great example of that. You've got biosynthesis, you've got toxin clearance, and you've got vascular regulation. If you throw in the macrophages and nitric oxide there, then you've got even more things going on. So it's a way the body can generate complexity out of the same systems. All right, so one cycle, many uses. We kind of beat that to death already. All right, what messes up the urea cycle? So we've talked about what it does. So sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So sex is genetics. So there are inherited defects in every enzyme and transporter in the urea cycle that we see as clinical manifestations of disease. We've, um, we've been following these. Some of them are late onset, some of them are childhood onset, but there are rare diseases for all of these. 
Drugs, common seizure medication of alproic acid, the chemotherapy, compound cyclophosphamide, acetaminophen damage to the liver will all interfere with the urea cycle function. Some directly, valproic acid will actually interfere with the rate limiting enzyme, which is carbamyl phosphate synthetase. Acetaminophen will do it by simply taking the liver out of the picture, destroying the liver tissue so there's no tissue to clear the ammonia from. So by doing these things, you can actually mess it up at a couple of levels. The rock and roll is mainly because I wanted to make this pun, so I kind of had to fit it in somewhere. But viruses, you know, the uh, hepatitis viruses and things, that kind of goes with the rock and roll lifestyle. Alcohol, um, hypoxia and shock from when they do whatever they do to themselves. Um, other things, though, like if you go on cardiopulmonary bypass for heart surgery, um, that will actually interfere with urea cycle function by shunting blood away from the gut, damaging some of the vascular endothelial, things like that. And then if you actually drink your liver into submission or virally put it into submission or chemically put it into submission, you scar it down, then you no longer have that activity going on in the liver and you lose your cycle function. So you can get around it, you can actually damage it a number of ways. Interestingly enough, this kind of nitrogen metabolism is, metabolism is one of the most basic biochemical functions. Urea cycle enzymes exist in all three major phyla. So whether you're a fungus or a fish or a plant, you have some version of a nitrogen metabolism cycle that has similar enzymes. And just for instance, the uh, mouse enzyme and human enzyme for carbamyl phosphate synthetase have 98% homology to each other. And if you do that kind of comparative biology, that's pretty damn high. Okay, so rare defects. Let's start on the extreme end of the graph, shall we? Like you have a choice. Um, what happens if I destroy the urea cycle? So I have a genetic defect, and we'll go with my favorite enzyme, which is carbamyl phosphate synthetase, and I did completely wipe it out. So obviously you can no longer process ammonia. The other thing you can do is you can't produce urea. You also can't make arginine or citrulline. Well, we've been treating these patients now for about 30 to 40 years, and we actually have found ways around that. For the ammonia, we have drugs we can use to scavenge nitrogen from the system. For the urea, we can actually give them arginine and citrulline, which they can then convert into urea on their own. And then for the arginine and citrulline, you need for other biological processes. We can give it to you orally, you'll absorb it, and instead of it being an essential amino acid, then you can get a supply of it from that. So we've been working with this a lot of years. It's not an easy life for these patients. It's really tough. One of the things we discovered back around 2000 when we pulled all the experts in the field together is that we didn't know what the hell we were doing. So we got, actually we locked everyone in a basement. I don't know if we could do that these days, but put a chalkboard up, which also we can't do these days because you can't find a chalkboard anymore. And they actually then tell them, write out your best treatment protocol for caring for these patients. So had 15 of the world's experts doing this. What we found is only about 20% of what we all thought we knew was th were things in common. The rest of it, everyone was doing something different. So one of the things we started doing is realized we needed to get our act together and start doing that. So we formed the Urea Cycle Disorders Consortium, which is an international consortium, and now it also has 24 sites in Europe. But we have data now on about 700, 800 patients that we've collected over the years where we've actually been looking at what we were doing and see if it made sense. And then the, probably the most important thing is we got everybody on the same page therapeutically. We shared our treatment protocols, we shared what we were doing, when there was a new patient, we would talk it out amongst ourselves to try to figure out what to do. And did this have an effect? Yes. So when I started in 1985, the odds that a newborn with a hyperemonemic crisis would make it to five years were less than 5%. So when we started introducing some of the new drugs and compounds and treatments in the 90s, that got up to about maybe 40 to 50%. Now, about 10 years into the consortium, the odds that a child will make it to five years with a neonatal presentation are about 97, 98%. That is actually with the intro no introduction of a new concept drug. That's actually just using what we already had, but actually figuring out what worked best and talking to each other. The cancer people figured this out a long time ago. Children's oncology group, a lot of the common things, they talk to each other all the time. One of the things we're doing in rare disease is doing the same. Our problem is we have 8,000 diseases to work with and sometimes only five patients. 
in some of the groups. One of the urea cycle disorders, there are only five patients in the U.S. Try to develop a comprehensive treatment strategy when basically you've got five folks to work with, all of whom are genetically distinct in their molecular defect from each other. But that's what you have to do. We've improved their neurocognitive too. Even though we've increased survivability, you might have actually expected a decrease in the survivors, but depending on when you were born, you actually now, and actually we're right at about 100 on the average IQ for the newborns with that. Before it was about um, IQ of 50 for the survivors from that. So we're doing a lot better as far as neurocognitive outcome goes. All right, so common things. So that is the, that's the rare end of the spectrum. These are kids that take huge amounts of resource to treat, require early diagnosis, and then require a lifetime of care, even when we do a liver transplant. So I'm gonna ask you a question that most um, medical professionals who have already graduated will miss. Is there anyone who feels like being picked on so far? Actually, I'm gonna pick on one of you guys from earlier. You, sir, right there. Okay, so <laughs> is that okay if I, okay, good, yeah. All right, patient involvement's good then, all right. Yeah, otherwise, he's going to talk to me and take my check back. Um, <laughs> just kidding. So, if I did a liver transplant on you for a carbamyl phosphate synthetase deficiency, first enzyme in the pathway, knowing that tissue distribution we looked at just a minute ago, am I going to fix all aspects of your disease? The fact that you're asking that question. Exactly, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, these guys are good, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the answer, of course, is no. Why? Well, what does the liver do? It's the ammonia detox. Now, that's the thing that'll kill you. Um, actually, not having arginine will kill you, too. It just takes longer. But I'm going to fix the ammonia problem. What I'm not going to fix is the biosynthetic problem. Now, if I've got a defect in ASS or ASL, I can fix the ammonia problem if I do a liver transplant, but I can't fix the nitric oxide problem. And one of the things we noticed a few years ago is our ASS and ASL patients did a lot worse than our others when we treated them all kind of the same, when we got everything kind of on the same page. We actually think that's because we cannot address their inability to sufficiently generate nitric oxide in different tissues like the brain and other places. So well done, sir, well done. All right, so what type of environments have we been looking at? Um, we've been looking at extreme prematurity, which is kind of where we started. We've also done a lot of work in high-dose chemotherapy and bone marrow transplant. We've been looking at cardiac surgery, and then we've been looking at the elderly with acute respiratory distress syndrome. This model is actually the cleanest. Why? Surgeons and anesthesiologists are creatures of habit. Children, and this is in children with congenital heart disease. So they have pretty much similar type lesions, they try to do the ORs under control conditions. Most of these are elective surgeries, so it's done in a very controlled system. The next one is probably chemotherapy, um, because that's, you know, you're basically giving someone enough stuff to almost kill them, but not quite, but it's done under pretty controlled conditions. Extreme prematurity, that one has not quite too many variables to work with. You know, the hardest group to work with are elderly patients who have multi-system organ failure because there are just so many things going on. But we've actually looked at the system in all of them. I'll tell you kind of what we found. So first question, are there common genetic changes in the urea cycle that affect function? I would not be giving you this lecture if there were not. Of course there are. Does the choke point enzyme CPS1 have a common genetic change? Of course it does. Once again, I would not be giving you this lecture if it did not. Turns out that at uh, amino acid residue 1405, uh, and actually, you're gracious. Is it, is it a subdean deanlet? I don't know what the right deanlet. Okay, is actually going to help me out by doing some of the structural function on this. We've actually done the uh, enzyme function levels on this. It's got about a 40% kinetic difference between the two versions of the enzyme. So, about 45% of you in this room are carriers for this genetic change that has a significant impact on your urea cycle. Now, here's the interesting thing: CPS1 is actually your most common mitochondrial protein. In some old studies, about 20% of mitochondrial protein weight is carbamyl phosphate synthetase. So there's a lot of it. So you've got a lot of excess capacity. Um, so maybe a 40% change for day-to-day -day wear and tear doesn't really have any effect on you. And in, indeed it doesn't, since you're not all wandering around 
you know, deficient in nitric oxide and hyperammonemic, at least most of the time. Now, let's talk about nitric oxide for a minute. It's a vasodilator, it's a signaler, it's a relaxer, it's in the brain muscle vasculature. So, do you all know about the inverse law of medical publications? Usually the more publications there are on a topic, the less we understand it. So it's kind of an inverse law thing. Would you agree with that? Thank you. Yeah, like you're going to say now. Yeah. <laughs> so as of 9.30 this morning, there are 124,285 articles on nitric oxide, which means we really don't know what it does very well. And it does a lot of things. It's kind of like TGF beta for those of you who work on that. It's everywhere, it's nowhere, and it does all kinds of things. There are only 5,000 articles on the urea cycle, which means we understand it much better than we understand nitric oxide metabolism, which there's actually some truth to that. So this is the old pathway um, from Fred Murad, where you take citrulline, you convert it into arginine, and then you can go and make nitric oxide, or it can deviate into urea. 85% of your arginine in your body, if I look at it as a mass effect, goes into making urea. The other 15% gets used for nitric oxide, which doesn't sound like much until you realize that's if you look at the whole body. In the lung, 100% of the uh, stuff coming through, or at least 90% of it, goes into making nitric oxide. In the gut, it's, none of it really goes into making much of anything. It gets exported. So it depends on where you are as far as what this does. Now, the other thing you need to know is that this is not a binary equation. So it's not that if you don't have enough citrulline and arginine, you can't make nitric oxide. Something else happens as well. Turns out the enzyme's a dimer. Uh, and actually, to stay a dimer, it has to have arginine sitting in the pocket. So no arginine, no dimer. Well, the enzyme, when it de-dimerizes, does not know that it has to shut off. So it actually keeps functioning, but it no longer makes nitric oxide. What it actually does when it de-dimerizes is makes free radical oxygen molecules and actually starts making peroxynitrites and things like that. Maybe one of the reasons why inducible nitric oxide, which is present in macrophages in the immune system, may be able to do its work. You may actually want it in that condition, generating, you know, spitting out all of these uh, electrons and oxygen type things there, because that could be actually a damaging thing for something the macrophage is latched onto. But in an endothelial cell, that's a bad idea. So suddenly you go from making a vasodilator to making something that will damage the tissues themselves. All right, so let's talk about persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. How many of y'all got to read that paper? I apologize. Um, it's always embarrassing when someone reads your work because you always look back at it and kind of go, yeah, I wish I'd done that a little different. But it's what we had at the time. I hope if you enjoyed it, great. Um, if not, suffer along with me. All right, let's see if I can find the... There we go, yeah. All right, so newborns have diminished urea cycle. Why do kids have decreased biochemical capacity at birth? Anyone want to speculate? Exactly. Mom has been carrying them biochemically and then will for the rest of their life, unfortunately, um, <laughs> has been actually doing that. So at birth, you only have about 40% of your activity for urea cycle. Um, so about 1 in 250 newborns, that's pretty darn common, will develop a respiratory distress after a stressful birth. Half of those kids will go on to develop pulmonary hypertension. And you're kind of like, well, so what? Well, actually, a lot of those kids die because suddenly they can no longer oxygenate because they can't pump the blood through that newly opened up lung. And so they're shunting, they become hypoxic. And one of the things that they did back in the 90s was they actually treated these kids with gaseous nitric oxide, which is why I kind of started thinking about, okay, these kids don't have enough nitric oxide. You give them some external nitric oxide, suddenly those arteries open back up, their pulmonary hypertension goes away, they can treat them. There's a problem with that though. Who knows what the molecular half-life of nitric oxide is? Boy, if you guys do, I'm going to be impressed as hell. 20 milliseconds. So the second you shut the gas off, the second that gas gets cleared by the ventilator, that effect is gone. And those arteries can go right back down. So we thought it would be important to try to figure out what the underlying um, process was in this. So the treatment, like I said, was gaseous nitric oxide. So we looked at 65 term infants. 
So this is that polymorphism I was telling you about earlier, T1405. Um, interesting story. Let me, let me stop and tell you a quick story. It's, let me see how I am on time. I'm good, yeah. So back in 1992, when I was first working with CPS, we had about 20 patients in the freezer. And I hate to say that, but that was all that remained of those patients. They'd all died with CPS1 deficiency. And we're trying to figure out the genetic defects in those. So sequencing one of the patients, and we found this polymorph, uh, well, I say polymorphism now, but actually we found what we thought was the mutation in that patient. Because back then we didn't have the genetic structure, PCR was brand new. It was a ton of work to do any kind of sequencing. So I sent this mutation off to a buddy of mine in Valencia, Spain, who worked on the enzymology. Got this great, he's a bit of an excitable guy, but I got this three-page letter back telling me how this mutation had obviously killed this kid because this residue in amino acid was conserved all the way back to you know, the dawn of time and rock and that it would change the kinetic binding properties of the cofactor for the enzyme and so on and so forth. So I'm just going, wow, I found the first mutation in this disease gene. Then I, made, then I did what fortunately I'm glad I did, which is I figured out enough genomic sequence around it so I could actually amplify and then check some folks who did not have CPS1 deficiency, and what I found is 45% of the population actually had this change in it. So now knowing that it's a, pop, it's a polymorphism and that the most common cause of death on the planet is not CPS1 deficiency, I then figured, okay, this is probably not what killed this kid and found his mutation later on. But it always kept me thinking that this uh, variant would probably have some structural significance, and as we said, it's got about a 40% kinetic difference. So of our 65 patients, that we picked, 31 patients developed echocardiogram determined persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So we started looking at some of their intermediates. Yeah, you know, you get one New England Journal paper, you always put that on the slide, subtly in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say, you know? Probably shouldn't do that anymore. Um, but we actually looked, okay, so what about, this is when these kids hit the floor. So this is before they really manifested their disease. What are their arginine and citrullines? And actually, what are their nitric oxide metabolites? Because you can't really directly measure it, because remember, it's only got a 20-second half-life look like. And what we found is before these kids even got sick, the ones who were going to go on and develop pulmonary hypertension had lower arginines, lower citrullines, lower nitric oxides. In fact, when we looked at their nitric oxide metabolites, they did not even overlap between the two groups which I think is probably why New England Journal took it. Then we looked at their genotypes, and I don't like zeros. Why? It always looks like you cook the books. But actually, none of our patients who had the high-functioning version of the enzyme, so the A version is actually the one that has 40% more kinetic activity than the other one. Interesting factoid, this is actually a gain-of-function mutation in humans. The evolutionarily conserved base is the one that has 40% less activity. This is actually an interesting example of where a polymorphism coming in is, and actually when we've looked at populations, it spreads very quickly once it gets into them. I actually did some interesting things that I'll tell you another time in the mountains of Peru with a bioarchaeology project with mummies. So we'll, we'll save that. Um, but what we found is that the AAs did not develop pulmonary hypertension. That was a significant change in their risk, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's talk about heart surgery. So about 25 to 30,000 kids get heart surgery every year in the United States for congenital heart defects. About 20 to 25% of those patients will develop post-cardiac surgery pulmonary hypertension. That means their blood vessels reactively constrict down. Now some kids, depending on the heart defect, go into the surgery with pulmonary hypertension because they're running systemic pressures to their lungs. Most don't though. So this is a big problem for these kids, about a 5 to 10% mortality rate, depending on which center you look at, which means it's actually one of the leading causes of death after heart surgery for kids. So it's a very stressful environment. I, if, you ever, if any of y'all ever sat in on a heart surgery, okay, you, know, you crack the chest open, and then what do you pour in the chest cavity? Ice water. So actually to slow down and stop the heart, they open up these kids' chests, and then they take a big old bucket of ice water and dump it in the chest cavity to slow everything down. It's kind of one of the weirder things you'll see. Um, if you do watch one, be aware that the last thing they're going to do is poke a needle in the heart to let the air out and make sure that it's filled with blood again as it pumps and that that will start to fountain. And that's usually when you pass out because that's when I passed out. Um, 
a true story. Um, but it's a very stressful environment. Uh, but the other thing we know is when we put you on pulmonary bypass, you actually shunt your blood away from the gut and the liver. And also, there's actually damage to the liver while you're on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine and the gut as well. So what happens? What do you think that's going to do to your citrulline production? Going to go up or down? Right, it's going to go down. I, we're done here, actually. These guys have got this stuff. All right. So what happens? So we've actually now looked at about 600 patients undergoing heart surgery for this. So we've done actually a fairly decent in here. Uh, not your rare disease category anymore. So when we look at preoperative levels of citrulline, here's what we see. Immediately post-op, it's here. At 12 hours, it's here, 24, 48. It doesn't start coming back till about 72 hours. The peak occurrence of post-op pulmonary hypertension is right here around 12 hours. Arginine does the same thing. Um, now, you say, okay, well, you don't feed these kids, so there's no nitrogen, so of course they're going to drop their citrulline and arginine production. If you look at the rest of the amino acids, they actually go up, not down. So it's not actually a nutritional restriction. That was one of the things we worried about when we first did this. The other thing we looked at is, was the citrulline predictive of who went on to develop uh, pulmonary hypertension? Turns out it was. The next thing we did is we pulled out our old chestnut, the T1405N polymorphism. And originally, the um, dogma in the field at the time had been that bypass time and age would be the best predictors. Actually, they weren't predictors at all. It turns out how long you were on bypass really didn't predict well. Down syndrome was one of the better predictors, and there's actually an interesting tie into nitric oxide metabolism there that's another nice long story we'll tell another day. But our CPS1 polymorphism was actually the best predictor. So if you had the high functioning uh, hap uh, homozygote haplotype, you were very unlikely to develop. And in fact, it was almost a six fold difference between how often, and we're talking about something with a 25% occurrence. So that's actually a big difference on whether or not you go on and develop post-op pulmonary hypertension. Now the other thing is genetic association studies have a bad history of reproducibility. Some folks would say only 5% of them reproduce. So one of the things, one of the reasons we went and collected 600 patients is we actually built a same size cohort and actually then revalidated it on the separate cohort on this. So this is actually was tested originally. We looked at these, found the risk factors, and then went and tested it in the second cohort and got exactly the same answer. All right, ARDS. I swore I would never work on this disease. Um, growing up at Vanderbilt, which is one of the places they did a lot of the NF-kappa-B and TGF-beta, everyone wanted to talk about inflammatory responses in the lung and elderly acute respiratory distress. The problem is these patients are elderly, they're coming in with pneumonias typically, their lungs flood out, and unfortunately about half of them die from that. The biggest deal with that from my standpoint though is multifactorial. These are folks with a lifetime of different things going on. So their systems are worn down. Some of them have diabetes, some don't, some of them have COPD, some of them have all kinds of things going on. So it's very reluctant to look at this. However, Vanderbilt had a large cohort of these patients that they looked at to see whether or not they went on to develop. So we measured their citrulline levels, and as it turns out, citrulline was an excellent predictor uh, at admission. Now, I'm not talking after they get sick. At admission to the hospital, citrulline was actually the, ended up being the best predictor of ARDS development in these patients. And this one is probably not the ability to make nitric oxide. This one's actually probably the uncoupling. Because what we've actually seen is the same thing in premature infants. So two ends of the spectrum. Very old patients who are very medically fragile tend to be more likely to develop acute respiratory distress syndrome if they have low citrullines. Premature infants are much more likely to go on to develop lung damage, lung inflammation, and injury, which actually looks a lot like ARDS just in a very isolated event if they have very low citrullines. So there's some real interesting work we're doing with the University of Utah on premature infants. We have a national consortium looking at this, and we actually think we may have a way to therapeutically nudge some of the lung damage in premature infants. We'll fix it all, but it may help. Just to show you, we didn't do all this work ourselves. Um, we actually talked to a group over in uh, the Netherlands at Maastricht to look at um, basically necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a gut uh, 
uh, ischemic problem in uh, newborn infants, and they found that actually the T1405N was their best predictor for that as well. So definitely seems like it's got some traction. Now, these are all the things we've been looking at for this, but the thing about association studies is that's nice, but so what? Um, yeah, it's really true, isn't it? Uh, so one of the students early in the group here actually used my favorite quote, which is the most exciting phrase here in science is not eureka, but that's funny. And that's actually how this all started. It's kind of like, huh, that's kind of weird. So if you're going to do this kind of research, you've got to carry it through to its logical conclusion, which is you should do something about it. So what did I tell you earlier about our urea cycle patients? We've been giving them citrulline and arginine for decades. With a lot of safety, with a lot of efficacy, we can replace the stuff they don't make. Why can't we do it in these patients? So this is your only graphic that does anything moving for the day. Translational science, <laughs> the most overabused term in modern medicine. I, you know, most people, is, they beat it to death. So if you read a grant, usually the last sentence in the grant is, and someday this may help treat a patient. So that's the translational part of their grant. But I felt kind of obligated after doing all this work and with the folks I was working with, which is a huge list of people. Um, I, I can't even give credit to all of them because literally we're talking about over 100 people are involved in all these studies. We needed to go back and do something. So we decided to do that. So what's your obvious conclusion? We should give them arginine, right? That should help. As it turns out, I can pump you full of arginine. I can give you 10 millimolar. And remember, normal arginine is about 100 micromolar. And your nitric oxide production will really not budge and your intracellular arginine levels will really not change. What the heck? So back away a few years back, they had these things called heart bars. So they were selling people heart healthy bars that had huge amounts of arginine. It was a complete waste of money. So part of the reason for that is kind of how we think of biochemistry. So normally we think of biochemistry as a big old hefty garbage bag that I poured some water and some enzymes and some precursors in and I shake it up and then through Brownian motion, all the reactions happen. If we were actually built like that, we would not have gotten much past the slime mold stage. But what does happen is actually you organize enzymes into assembly lines. And it kind of makes sense. That's not a new concept. By lining the enzymes up on some form of substrate, and a lot of times it's membranes, they're actually next to each other. They hand off substrate one to the other. And so we actually call this substrate tunneling. So by passing it through these chains, it's very efficient, it's very quick, but it also means you have to know what the entry point is. So we went back and did a little work. So we started looking for large complexes that had all our enzymes. And we actually found we could identify supersized complexes that had endothelial nitric oxide synthase, arginosuccinic acid lyase, and arginosuccinic acid synthase. And if you want to, I can show you these more later on, but I'm not gonna go through and point out each individual band, but basically, all the enzymes were bound to heat shock protein 90. So they had, think of it as like a set of Legos. The heat shock protein is like the Lego base, and then you put the little enzymes on there. And what we found is we get different complexes in different tissues. Remember how I showed you earlier that you have different tissue specificities? Well, we found actually, depending on where you look, they complex differently. Guess what? In the liver, instead of having nitric oxide synthase, you have arginase, the last enzyme to make urea. In the gut, you don't have anything, you just have the ASS and the ASL in there. And in uh, lung, it's different, for, so it's a little different everywhere you look. So what we found, and we published this a few years ago, is that actually, to get into this system, you come in here with citrulline. You never see floating argininosuccinic acid, you never see floating arginine. In fact, intracellular levels of arginine are actually quite low, they're well below what circulates in the plasma. And what gets it in? Well, it's a neutral amino acid transporter called SNAT1. So the way to actually activate this system is not to go for arginine. It's not to go for um, ASA. You actually have to go back two enzymatic steps before you can access it. So what we decided then is, okay, well, let's try citrulline. Let's see if that will work. So here's kind of the scheme where we are. I stress you. Bypass, take your pick. So. I've now decreased your biosynthetic ability to make uh, urea cycle intermediate citrulline and arginine. But let's say genetically you've got that 40% plus version of the enzyme. So you've got, you're more likely to be able to make more citrulline. And you say you can make just enough. Well, 
you keep your nitric oxide synthase coupled and you make enough nitric oxide, you sail on through. But let's say you fall below the bar. Let's say you don't quite make enough citrulline to maintain your nitric oxide synthesis and keep the enzyme coupled. Two things happen. One, you can't make enough NO, which means you lose your vascular dilation. But the other thing is now you've uncoupled your nitric oxide synthase and it'll start generating free radicals which will actually damage the tissues further, which leads to more stress. And this actually very rapidly becomes a negative feedback loop. So if I feed human endothelial cells arginine, I get almost no nitric oxide production. This is under stimulus from acetylcholine. If I, those are my controls, those are my arginines. If I feed them citrulline, suddenly I get a huge bump. So this is actually getting into the cells and making that. And we've done this experiment in numerous ways, and I will not bore you with 10 years of data on this. If I give them histamine, that basically means they strip all their resources from inside the cell and make it because you put them into overdrive. Now, one of the things you would worry about, if I gave you citrulline and it suddenly makes you make a lot of nitric oxide, could that be a good thing or a bad thing? It could be a bad thing. You don't want to suddenly vasodilate everything. It's got to be under tight control. So one thing we looked at was under stress and non-stress conditions. And under normal conditions, if I give citrulline to cells or to animals, I don't really change the nitric oxide production much from the control, and I don't change the blood pressure, which is actually even more important. If I stress them so that they can't make enough nitric oxide, uh, so you know, under this condition, I add the citrulline back in, I can pretty much get back to normal production. So you just basically, this is macroeconomics or microeconomics, depending on how you choose to define it. Supply and demand. You need a supply of citrulline to make the nitric oxide. You don't have the supply, you can't make it. Now, the other thing, remember we talked about um, the enzyme falling apart. So if I take uh, normoxic cells or hypoxic cells, hypoxic cells that are just stressed and I don't add anything into them, you start to see the uh, nitric oxide synthase monomer. Normoxic, it's coupled, and then that's um, adding citrulline in under normoxic conditions there, and it stays coupled. If I take my hypoxic uncoupled cells, and I add citrulline back in, one of the things we're hoping to see is recoupling of the nitric oxide synthase. And sure enough, that's actually what we got. So not only can we bump the amount of nitric oxide being made, we can actually recouple the enzyme as well. Oh, golly. Um, this one takes a bit. I'll summarize. If we knock down the SNAT1 transporter, remember that solute neutral amino acid transporter I talked about, and we use an siRNA to take it out? suddenly you lose the ability to make nitric oxide under stress conditions because you can't get the citrulline into the cell. So one of the things we wondered is, is this a closed system? Is the stuff inside of the cell going to be enough to make it, or do you actually have to be able to put outside citrulline into the system to do it? And it turns out if you take the transporter out, you recreate the pathology where you can no longer make nitric oxide, and you uncouple your enzyme. Do you all want me to dwell on this anymore? Okay, good. Same thing here. Okay, so now let's go up a step. So we've been doing cells now. Let's do some arteries. So when we take arteries out and we grow and they're in room air and we look at vascular constriction after injecting them with acetylcholine, you actually, and this is done by Candace Fike, who may be one of the best pulmonary physiologists as far as doing this kind of work I've ever run across. She's meticulous in what she is. There are actually error bars on those graphs. Yeah, you can't see them because the error is so low on this. So if you add citrulline in under normal conditions, you get more. If you make them hypoxic, you get almost no vasodilation under stimulation with acetylcholine, but you can preserve some of it. You'll see the graphs axes are a little different if you add citrulline back in. So now we've gone from cells, now we're doing arteries. Now let's do a whole lung. If we run a whole lung on a perfusate system, we add citrulline in, we can increase their nitric oxide. We also can preserve vascular flow in that system. If we add arginine in, we don't really do it. And then if we look at a piglet who is raised in a hypoxic environment, and this is a controlled pulmonary hypertension. Here's his hypoxic, so his pulmonary vascular resistance goes up. If we've been feeding that pig citrulline from day one, we actually, they don't develop the pulmonary hypertension. So at this point, we're about ready to go and try this on some humans. We picked the cardiac surgery model is the first one to do why. These patients are done electively. 
The newborns, you don't know when they're going to come in, and you don't know how sick they're going to be when you come in, so you might lose your effect depending on where they are in their clinical course. The surgical patients, you know when they're coming in, you know when they're going to be done, and it's done in a very orderly procession. So the first trial we did, and this is Dr. Heidi Beverly and Dr. Rick Barr, and the most important person in the picture right here is Jerry Rice, who is our research nurse, who has an enrollment rate of over 95% for every clinical study I've ever done with her. We're not sure if she uses hypnosis drugs or what. <laughs> um, so we gave oral citrulline to these patients because we had no IV citrulline. One of the things we didn't know is that actually oral citrulline is absorbed very poorly from the gut. So we got huge variations in the amount that came in. But we actually found that the patients who got plasma levels up to the lower limit of normal did not develop post-op pulmonary hypertension. Rick Barr is now the chair of pediatrics at Arkansas Children's. Heidi is in Florida. Actually, I think she's division chief now. So all of the people I used to work with and train are now senior to me. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says. So after doing this, we realized that we couldn't do this with oral, so we switched over to IV, which I believe is the second paper you guys looked at, right? So we had to do pharmacokinetics and figure out what was going on. So that we published this in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. And what we found, surprise, surprise, if I inject you with intravenous citrulline, your citrulline levels go up. So what else we found, though, is your arginine levels go up and your ability to make nitric oxide goes up. Now here's the interesting thing. There are about 30 patients we ended up doing eventually in this study. Um, only two of them developed pulmonary hypertension. Those two patients had what? Down syndrome. The rest of them didn't. So it's kind of interesting. So there's another interesting model going on here that we're going to play with. Now, I'm going to make this fun because y'all haven't seen the next one. In fact, actually the next one is not published yet, but it will be soon. So we went to the FDA because we said, hey, we got a great way to prevent pulmonary hypertension. And we sat down with an FDA committee and we're thinking, hey, we're going to make the world a better place. We're going to make kids healthier after. And the FDA said, so what? And they said, well, that's fine that if you reduce the pulmonary vascular pressure after surgery, how does that benefit the patient? What does it do physically for them that is a perceived benefit? Because this is a physiologic measurement for pulmonary hypertension. So they wanted something specific. So we sat down and we kind of scratched our heads and he said, well, one thing we know is that patients with pulmonary hypertension are on ventilators a lot longer than patients who aren't. So I said, okay, maybe the amount of respiratory support they require afterwards would be something good. So we said, what about their ventilator times? I said, that's okay. Why would being on a ventilator longer be bad for you? Speculate, folks. Anybody? Yeah, what else? A little bit, that's if you're on a really long time. So we're talking like days versus maybe three or four hours. Yes, that's the biggie, absolutely. Yeah, um, fluid changes, um, irritation in the lung, all those things, infection being one of the biggest ones, though. So, what did being on citrulline in our phase two FDA clinical trial do for that? We actually noticed and found that there was a 75% in average ventilator time for these patients, and actually most of them actually extubated in the um, OR or immediately in post-op uh, because of their pulmonary function being so good. So, what we're doing now in our phase three clinical trial at FDA, and so, actually, I should have done this earlier. I do have a conflict here. Vanderbilt University owns the uh, pharmaceutical rights to citrulline and as the inventor um, I uh, have at least some role in that through uh, Vanderbilt University but I have been involved in none of these clinical trials directly because that would be a huge conflict of interest. So what's kind of not fun is you invent something and then you don't get to play with it anymore. Um, so this is in phase three at now about 20 centers in the US. They're about halfway through the phase three and if you don't know what phase three is that's the pivotal trial to prove if something's going to go on and get FDA approval for that. So if that's the case, you know, that'll be good for us. And, uh, but I don't get any money for this, but my laboratory does. So that's that. These are some of our kids. But the thing I'd like you to remember is that if you have a patient with a rare disease, like a urea cycle defect or homocystinuria, these are just take any of the different things, they can teach you a lot about your other patients. Because they're an extreme example of what can go wrong. But if you look at it in the right way and you kind of squint a little bit, you can actually say, okay, what would a real mild version of this disease look like? And what's an environmental condition where this could get triggered?
So one of the things I've spent a lot of my time and career doing is looking at the patients I see in clinic, in our genetics clinic, and trying to imagine what would this look like in the general population if I dialed this way back. And what you find is that a lot of human disease can model in a milder fashion one of these rare diseases. And I think that's probably a good place to break for questions. Thank you, Marshall. There's actually a clinical trial at Vanderbilt going on in the adult pulmonary ICU group using citrulline and actually the cofactor for nitric oxide synthase, which is BH4. Um, the early data is promising. But I can't, I, I, the promising doesn't mean it works. It just means it's promising. So yes, that actually is going on. We also have a clinical trial going on in uh, sickle cell anemia. That's actually one we're doing just on our own. We found that in sickle cell lung crisis, um, we can reduce the amount of time in the ICU on ventilatory support and actually cut the opioid use quite a bit in those patients because the pain level's lower. Much higher. Okay. So think, if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, most of these, okay, so they're roughly right now, if you go online, there's about 8,000 different rare conditions. We found a gene that's associated with a disease. There are currently 500 FDA approved treatments for rare diseases. And for some of those, they actually are the same disease a couple of times. So there's probably only about 420, something like that. There's a monster gap between what we know and what we can do. And so families are highly incentivized. Even the ones where there's already a therapy, folks will enroll in. We'll typically get, you know, if I go in to a clinical trial and I have 10 patients with this disease, I'll typically, all 10 of them will enroll. In fact, actually, if I don't call them and ask them to enroll, they will call me and say, why didn't you call me and ask me to enroll? Or their parents will, I should say. Yeah, certainly. to the arginine bars. I remember actually being in the gym working out seven, eight years ago, and people were eating these arginine bars. And somebody pulled out some papers and showed me. They have no idea, based on, I understand what you said about the half-life of NO, and I, I don't get it. But somebody apparently came up with some data to support that there was some cardio, cardiometabolic Oh, there is a little bit. It's, there's a leak through. Okay. So actually what you really want is a citrulline bar. And we've actually played with that. We give oral citrulline. We did this with some healthy volunteers, i.e. undergraduates. Um, <laughs> call it like it is. And actually what you find is actually um, cardiovascular um, blood flow goes up a little bit. Uh, and actually if you go online and search citrulline, and you've got to be careful when you search stuff online because you creepy things. Um, but what you'll actually find, citrulline has become very popular in the professional bodybuilding world because evidently um, the, the term they use is your muscles get swole. I, <laughs> Please tell me what that means. I assume swollen is what they're going for, but I hope I didn't say something offensive. But basically, they'll get a big vascular dilation from that, and cardiovascular pump goes up from that. So actually, the easiest place to buy citrulline is online right now at the bodybuilding websites. But secondly, though, the thing I'm curious about, you talked about compartments, liver, heart, GI, et cetera. So in the brain, if you feed uh, arginine, you, you can do an in vivo experiment with anaphoresis of L-arginine, and you can actually drive NO production yeah. and measure it online and see all kinds of cool downstream neurophysiological effects. And, and so I don't know if that's because of the delivery system and transporters and uptake of the glial cells and neurons. I mean, why that behaves differently than in some other tissues. Right. And there's, there's potentially two things going on there. One is, my guess is, I'll make you a bet actually, if you had directly added citrulline in, you might not see as much effect. If you add arginine in, what have you bypassed? You've bypassed actually your two controlling steps before you get to nitric oxide. Like I said, all systems are leaky. I can put enough citrulline into a system, I mean ar enough arginine into a system to drive some nitric oxide production. The other thing though is you probably lost some of your regulation there because you're just gonna drive it. You know, the NO is, you know, if it's phosphorylated or non-phosphorylated, will control the enzyme some, but not a lot, and you can still force it through. 
What's interesting is if we actually go back two steps in an unstimulated system and just dump citrulline in there, not a lot happens. It's actually when you activate, you know, either through acetylcholine or whatever you're going to use that's the normal activator in that cell type, that's when you see actually a robust response. So one of the things I liked about um, using the citrulline instead of the arginine is all the regulatory mechanisms were still in place. One of the worries about using the arginine, and um, can I tell a story real quick? Sure. Okay. 1994, I'm from the South, we tell stories, sorry. Um, had a patient with urea cycle defect in the ICU. This patient had a vascular collapse in the doc's office and actually taken their kidneys out. So we had this patient on our classic cocktail of nitrogen scavengers and intravenous arginine because that's all we had at the time. After about a day, this patient, I walked into the ICU room. We had the ammonia under control, the patient was awake, but suddenly this patient looked like somebody had put an air hose in him and inflated him. He was bright red, it looked like every capillary in his body was vasodilated and we couldn't get it to respond to colloid, to um, intravenous epinephrine, dopamine, all the things you'd normally use for that. And I didn't know, understand it at the time. And then about a year later we figured out actually what had happened is by dosing that patient with arginine with no place in the kidneys for it to go, actually we had been poisoning that patient with nitric oxide. The patient didn't survive. They didn't survive because their kidneys were dead. Um, fortunately I don't think I killed them from that. But what we've learned from that is actually that urea cycle treatment. And now one of the common things we do when we manage these patients is we've noticed a lot of them when you start treating a urea cycle patient early on and you give them IV arginine because you've got to replace it, if the blood pressure starts to drop, if you turn the arginine drip down, the blood pressure comes back up. So I think it, you can slam it in, and there's probably some cells where it just uses it anyway, but you lose the regulatory system. You can do it too. That's fine. Yeah. We're actually going to have to do a PK study in the preemies before we do a clinical trial. I mean, um, right now I could guess pretty well because the patients we do are still pretty young. But in that premature gut that's never been exposed to digested protein except for the amniotic fluid, I'd be guessing. So we'll do a PK study before we start doing the preemies. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Vanderbilt's got an ongoing clinical trial in that. Vanderbilt's a place where they map some of the early genes in primary pulmonary hypertension, which is what you're referring to. Um, typically, that's due to a bone morphogenic protein receptor 2 uh, mutation. Um, early, I would say that it's definitely a factor. And actually, T1405N is one of the predictors on who goes on to develop it, because only about half the patients with the mutation get the pulmonary hypertension. I think the citrulline is probably not going to have a lot of effect on the more advanced patients because they've already remodeled their vasculature. The walls are thick. You're not going to do much for that. But you might have some effect on reactivity. Uh, a couple of years ago, I'm sure you're familiar with this, I think it was UAB in Birmingham, Wally Carlo, uh, the neonatologist, ran that big study with uh, nitric oxide. Yep. With the Didn't help. Babies. Took an enormous amount of heat on that. And I, as I understand it nationally, a lot of that was in terms of the control group and the standard of care. But did they actually get a good positive effect from that? No. Or didn't? Actually, what, um, so the big idea was to give uh, premature infants nitric oxide. And we actually think we know why it didn't work. Uh, mainly, it's actually not so much the ability to vasodilate, it's the coupling of the enzyme. Which nitric oxide gas will have no effect on the coupling of nitric oxide synthase. You can flood gas into those experiments all day long and it won't recouple. So we actually think it's the peroxynitrite damage in the cell that may have the bigger effect on the scarring and inflammatory response rather than just being able to vasodilate. Um, well, the main thing is you're going to probably increase your urea production a little bit, but that's not going to really hurt you. The kidney can take care of that okay. 
Uh, the nice thing is ASS, ASL, and ENOS to a certain degree too, all have pretty tight regulation. So you don't actually see um, you know, just a lot of downstream flooding there. Now the other question you're thinking, I think, is that the citrulline itself, when it builds up, and I give you a lot of it, have a toxic effect. So we have patients who have citrullinemia. In other words, they miss the ASS enzyme. So their citrulline levels will go sometimes as high as 10,000 micromolar. In other words, 10 millimolar. Normal level is about 20 to 40 micromolar. And what we find is actually we don't really see any side effects from that. You can actually tolerate a very, very high level of citrulline in your bloodstream. Now, and that's patients we've been seeing that in for 20 to 30 years with that high. So we think it's actually got a pretty good safety profile from that standpoint. That's a great question, though. Well thought. I got one follow-up question. Okay, and then you have to, okay, go ahead. No. Um, if you have, a, well, you talked about acetylcholine being an activator for this pathway. If you have a strong acetylcholinergic event in these citrulline-treated patients, do they tend to become syncopal? I'm trying to think because I'm certain we've had some. We haven't had any syncope. We've had the other thing. Remember, we're not treating these kids for long periods of time. We're treating them for about 72 hours, so around their surgery and afterwards. If, when we start doing the premature kids, we'll be doing it for a couple of weeks. Um, the patients on oral citrulline replacement who get pretty high levels of citrulline who have early stage urea cycle defects don't get syncopal under stress. So evidently, there's enough. There's enough. Um, feedback in the system to keep that from happening. I think it's just you've got enough supply. You're, if you were going to become syncopal, no matter what, you're going to become syncopal. This isn't, doesn't really seem to make you more sensitive to that. Yeah, great question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you mentioned that l can be more syncopal now. Um, yes, early stages. Yeah. Okay, for acute chest injury or? Right, for pulmonary, uh, for pulmonary crisis, yeah. So How far on the branch do you want me to crawl? <laughs> sure. Um, I, would, I would not go much further than right now. I have some promising and interesting data in pulmonary crisis and sickle cell patients. I don't think it would necessarily prevent sickling of the cells, in which case then, until you're actually in the pulmonary crisis, I don't, I don't know that it would be a preventative. It's certainly worth looking at. It certainly is something we plan to do long term, but right now, no. Unless you want to do the trial, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no direct effect of this stuff on pain. What you, if you're relieving the pulmonary crisis, so that will have an effect on pain. Okay. Yeah, there's not an opioid substitute. Before we close it, I just want to say, I think you all got a, a little glimpse of some of the exciting work going on at Children's National Medical Center. And Marshall and I have talked about enhanced collaboration Absolutely. we have with other people and I think there are going to be some exciting opportunities for graduate students, medical students and others who may be interested in some areas in connecting the children's and some of the research there. So for those of you who find this interesting, keep it in mind and you've got a great connection here in Dr. Summer. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Summer. For that.